So we're going to be talking tonight about moving towards family ministry. Um, this is the second in our um, series of faith development webinars, and each topic is we're trying to um, cover things that maybe we can't can't find as much information about in other places. So um, hopefully this will be useful for you. There's a time at the end, if you are doing this work and you have some stories you wanna share or, or just if you have questions, there'll be time at the end. So um, there's been a lot of talk in the last, um, actually I'd say it began nearly 10 years ago talking about um, that change was needed in the world of religious education. Um, several years ago, Kimberly Sweeney, who is an independent consultant, she's uh, uh, the principal behind Courageous Faith Consulting. She used to be part of the con Congregational Life staff in the New England region. She wrote a paper <clears throat> called The Death of Sunday School, which has been extended into uh, training webinars. Uh, there's a a discussion guide available to purchase uh, and it was a very provocative title and a lot of people you know thought oh my goodness what what is what does this mean the death of Sunday school and really what it means is that the type of Sunday school that most or that many of our congregations were offering to families was a, a, a model that wasn't really meeting the needs of of modern families of 21st century families uh, the model was, you know, a children in a classroom separated from the broader church community, um, age, you know, sort of age segregated, and um, a part of a good comprehensive religious education program is to have opportunities for that in combination with, uh, with whole congregation worship and ways of, and opportunities to engage with all ages. So part of the, the work that Kimberly was doing, you know, sort of, okay, the death of Sunday school, if what we knew isn't working, what's, what's next? What is the future? And um, her research and a lot of what um, many folks who are in <coughs> longtime religious educators or folks who are um, in, in, in conversation about this topic um, really understand that, that that the focus has always been on that Sunday morning experience, but that it's a it's a it's a fuller picture that the parent has always been and remains the number one religious educator for a child. You know, when you think about it, we have the children in our care uh, for sometimes less than an hour on a Sunday, uh, while parents have seven days. Um, you know, many parents. Uh, have, you know, full-time care of their children. Sometimes they don't, but they have far more time to influence. And studies show that, you know, what children learn, they learn <coughs> mostly in the home, uh, at least when it comes to values, when it comes to ethical, uh, ethical formation, identity formation, that, that a lot of that, the major influence there continues to be the parent. And the third aspect that Kimberly lifted up was the idea that whole congregation is really an important, should be an important facet of a faith formation program because we've had generations of having this, this upstairs, downstairs uh, separation. So our, our children are downstairs in religious education, you know, kind of having fun and having circle games and our youth <coughs> are engaged in more of a small group ministry style. Of, 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 of quote religious education and then as they get older and they move into the adult worship or if we try to bring them into adult style worship it's so different it it doesn't it's not it doesn't feel like what they have grown up with um, so how do we include them in that from an earlier age so that when they become 17 or 18 they begin to go into the full <clears throat> into the adult worship it's not a completely foreign experience for them. So meanwhile, um, <coughs> Joy Berry, who's the assistant director of the FAS Institute, the FAS, uh, is FAS Institute is located 
at Meadville Lombard. Um, and Joy has been a religious educator and she's, she's been very innovative in her approach to, uh, to how to build a, a all ages faith formation program. And this is, this is a, a, a diagram that she create, that was created based on her concept of how, uh, how faith formation happens in a congregation. And it's, it's based on the work of James Fowler, who, uh, whom if you've had um, a, a, re a Renaissance module or if you've just you know, sort of studied um, <coughs> how religious identity, how faith formation happens, Fowler did this work in the 40s and 50s. Um, and so it happens, you know, sort of, these are the things that happen, but, but they don't happen chronologically and they don't happen necessarily in a linear way. And so the top of that, of that um, graphic is the Fowler um, guidance. And then underneath is Joy's concept that what we need to do is we need to do this work together. We need to be creating faith together. So we're actively doing, um, doing faith formation and faith development all ages together in a collaborative way. So it, it very much um, is, is um, kind of complements the work that Kimberly Sweeney has been doing. So these are two sort of big, um, big picture ideas that have been running, rambling around in, in our e-circles for the last few years. We've also been um, doing some non-traditional but still um, based in curriculum models. And some of you may be familiar with this. You may be using these. Uh, some congregations um, have moved to family ministry focus, and we'll talk about that in a minute. Uh, some congregations are using thematic focus or uh, monthly themes, soul matters, to, uh, to create conversation and to create connection across the lifespan um, in the congregation. Some folks are using spirit play. Uh, spirit play is a little closer to a traditional curriculum, but it's story-based and it's very, uh, it's, it's, it's uh, experiential and it's, it's a very, it's a more open process than <coughs> a curriculum. Um, I mean, it's very structured, but it's, it's a little bit of a more open process than a curriculum, uh, like a tapestry of faith type curriculum. Uh, some congregations uh, have multi-generational worship on a regular basis. Sometimes um, the multi-generational worship is uh, holiday oriented. Uh, some congregations do it monthly. Some congregations, uh, their, multi their version of multi-generational worship is like, um, uh, you know, a children's chapel that includes uh, K through K through youth group, uh, and and you're mixing the the children and youth generations, uh, but not necessarily bringing um, bringing adults in. Full week faith is a term that we use for um, the work that that happens at home and the connections that we try to make with home. How are we? If you're using tapestry of faith, you may be familiar with those take at home sheets where we kind of give families activities or uh, big, big picture ideas, things to talk about as a family that complement or reinforce what's happened in, um, in RE or in, uh, in the Sunday program. So it's, it's, a, it's a way of continuing the conversation around faith formation beyond Sunday. <clears throat> um, some other non-traditional curriculum, but, cur but yet curriculum-based models um, could be a focus on life skills. Uh, you know, OWL is one example of that. Our whole lives is uh, really a life skills focus. It's not a, it's, it is based in curriculum, but it's also not um, necessarily the traditional model. Um, and then spiritual practice opportunities. So that could be things like a labyrinth walk. It could be, um, uh, different different uh, meditation or um, movement for um, for the all ages or for uh, particular age groups in the congregation. So these are things that 
are definitely uh, kind of floating around and are part of um, part of, of many of many um, congregational programs. I've had a request to mute because there's a little bit of fuzzy sound, so I'm going to just do that. Give me just a moment here. If you can mute yourself, even better. So, all right, I think we're good. <clears throat> so, um, moving on. So, so what is what is family ministry? Um, it's an approach to faith development that um, understands that faith development is a lifelong process. It's happening to all of us. Faith development is not. Um, is not something that is that only happens to children who are um, you know three to eighteen. It's something that we're all um, that we're all participating in, and and it's a develop it's developmental work that all ages are doing. Um, it also acknowledges that the, the the influence of the home is really key. It's really key to growing a Unitarian Universalist identity and to uh, just to building, building a sense of religious connection. Um, I mean, young, young people get, can certainly be connected to a place and to a community, but if it's not reinforced in the home, it can slip away. I mean, we talk, sometimes we, um, we talk with, with, with our broken hearts and a little bit of sadness about those those fourth and fifth grade boys that kind of slip away from us because we've, we've reached a point in the curriculum where it's just not engaging for them. Um, and so this is acknowledging that, um, you know, there's, there's work that's happening in the home and, and we can influence that. We're not doing that, but we can bring influence to it. <clears throat> and the other, another piece of family ministry is that it's, we're creating intentional community. <coughs> Um, you know, one of the things that I've always believed um, that is really integral to a, a, good, a good religious education program um, and to building identity is to focus on what makes us unique. Um, and what makes us unique is our theology, our history, our rituals, um, and, that, and that all of that work happens in community. You can be you can be an online Unitarian Universalist. You can you can go on and, and download Tapestry of Faith and do it yourself, but but it has it has a different meaning when it happens in community, intentional community. Family ministry, um, and it's interesting because of course when we're talking about family ministry in congregations, there's um, there's pushback you know, that pushback from uh, sometimes from folks who aren't in traditional family or don't, don't, wouldn't use that language, wouldn't use that terminology. So maybe a single older adult says, well, family ministry, that excludes me. Um, and in fact, I, I, did a, I did a startup with a congregation that has uh, moved, is moving to family ministry and has a new director of family ministry. And we we did an exercise with a group of about 25 people where, you know, we just sort of brainstorm, what does family mean to you? And at the end of that, some of the folks who had that feeling of, well, family ministry excludes me, really felt differently. Some of the things that came out of that brainstorm, well, hey, family is, is a comfort. Family is, for some people, family is not a positive. For some people, you know, people bring many meanings to family. And so when we're talking about family ministry, uh, if people are hearing it as, you know, mom, dad, cisgender, or mom, mom, you know, and, and two kids, that's, we need to help educate them and to, and to move them to a broader definition of family ministry. So, <coughs> excuse me. There it goes. So, um, Congregations, and there are some congregations that are uh, moving towards this family ministry model. And um, it looks different in just about every place that I have seen the family ministry experiment undertaken. 
but um, there are some common themes. <coughs> I would say that the most, the most um, uh, dominant uh, theme for congregations that are calling their program a family ministry program is that they're engaging in more frequent whole congregation worship. Um, does that mean every week? Sometimes it does. Sometimes it means once a month. Uh, but what it means is it means a commitment to creating worship that is, um, that is for everyone in, in some way, shape, or form. Now, the way that we do that can be very different. And what, what, makes, it, uh, what makes it feel like a good worship for a 10-year-old versus a 3-year-old versus a 53-year-old can clearly be very different. But if we are, um, if we're intentional about how we do that, if we, um, and we'll talk a little bit about some congregations that are doing that in, in just a couple of minutes. Um, so some of the other things that get emphasized um, is the social justice or social action uh, for, for a, a multi-age group. And I think many congregations have been involved in this for some time. You know, it's wonderful to have that, uh, the, the, the field trip to the, to the local food pantry to, to help, um, you know, to help pack food or, uh, uh, you know, go uh, man a table at the, at the local fall festival or things like that. I think many congregations have engaged with those kinds of uh, intergenerational larger group activities. And that is, that is an effective uh, piece of, of, of creating a family ministry paradigm. Parent and so parent support and education is key because we want, we know that parents are the primary educator. And if, and you know, we are a religious denomination where the majority of our adults come in from either an unchurched background or another origin faith. And so they don't necessarily have the understanding and the comfort with Unitarian Universalism to, to, to be the primary Unitarian Universalist educator for their, for their family. So, you know, we need to provide some resources. We need to provide some, we need to do some confidence building. We need to maybe create, you know, some kind of parent support network. Uh, is a parent support network mean that they all have to come on Tuesday night and we get a babysitter or childcare. No, family support network has, can be many things. It can be a Facebook group. It can be, um, it can be a buddy system. It can be, uh, it, it can be a number of different, it can look at in, in different, in different settings. So parent support education and at home, at home resources are to emphasize that, that home piece. Um, whole congregation educational events. Uh, some congregations are doing, um, and we're going to hear about a congregation in, in a few minutes that um, are doing, on Sunday, they have um, an educational opportunity for all ages. Um, they have a, a service, and maybe the service is a little bit shorter, and then that's followed up with sort of the family education hour, or 45 minutes, where the kids, so then everybody goes, kind of goes into uh, an age, age appropriate uh, education setting. Uh, so some congregations that have, um, have been challenged in putting together adult religious education that, you know, folks want to kind of want to buy into and, and show up for, uh, sometimes they have a, a better opportunity to do that when they do that on a Sunday morning when everybody's already there. You know, why, why make somebody come back on a Wednesday night, right? Um, and so, so those, are, those are some of the, I think, the main elements of how family ministry is being implemented in a number of congregations. Is this the only map? Absolutely not. Um, we're, this is a, a model that's very, is, is adaptive and very much in, you know, in, a, in formation itself. So we're kind of trying to figure out, um, is, there a, is there a family ministry model that, it, you know, just is a cookie cutter and a template and we can just take it and dish it out to, uh, a, to, to dish different congregations? That's probably unlikely 
in the long run, <coughs> but it's it's work that we're we're still doing. So I want to um, I want to share with you two different uh, experiments that are happening with um, with family ministry, and I have at the end there's a slide, and I'll I'll send you the PowerPoint. There's a slide at the end that has um, has links to some longer documents so that you can you know I'm just kind of capsule capsulizing them for you, um, but I'll I'll give you links so that you can look at these things yourself. <coughs> The UU Congregation of Binghamton, New York, um, they had, um, that, okay, I'm sorry, that slide's in the wrong spot. We'll, we'll go back to that other slide. Um, there was a, a model that was created. It's called the Binghamton model. And the religious educator at the time uh, was Ann Kadlicek. She was there for a two year interim. When she got there, um, there, you know, there were, uh, the program was in decline. Um, they um, were struggling with volunteers. Does that sound familiar to anybody? That may sound familiar. Uh, but those were the, the main symptoms of what was happening. And we know that that's, that's a symptom that's, that exists in many congregations, particularly the volunteer piece. You know, the volunteers, um, it's, we're just in a different time, a different context, um, when we look at uh, actual, you know, sort of data around volunteerism in general, um, it's down everywhere. So folks are busy. Uh, it's, there's just not, people are not making time to volunteer in the same way. Um, <coughs> the, um, the primary um, demographic groups that would make up uh, likely make up our religious education volunteers are millennials and um, and still some Gen Xers and so both of those groups have uh, a lower percentage of volunteerism in general so just different attitudes about it than the baby boomers and the and the older generations before the baby boomers so um, you know part of it is is just this is a generational difference um, it's not that people don't like to do the work. It's they're not. It just may not be part of, um, of of their kind of what their perception is around responsibilities and obligations in a faith community. So these things were happening in Binghamton, and um, you know sometimes we talk about change in congregations and we talk about the speed of church, and then everybody kind of laughs because when we talk about the speed of church, that usually means slow slow so Anne said you know we got to make some changes here i'm here for two years i'm really interested in 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 sort of creating uh doing some work and creating a model for family ministry so we're going to do this fast we are going to jump in we're going to leap into this um and she said you know shifting to family ministry is like rebuilding a house and you can't build a house one brick a day you know you have to you have to kind of commit to to creating the structure uh, so um, <clears throat> Anne was the religious educator uh, the interim religious educator she works she worked with um, a minister the Reverend Douglas Taylor who is who was very open to this. Um, uh, Douglas grew up as a Unitarian Universalist, his mother's a minister, so he had, um, he had the, the sort of the conditions were, were just right for Anne to come in, make this proposal, uh, and, and for, the, for there to be, you know, really strong buy-in from both the minister and from lay leadership. Um, they experimented during her time with uh, different kinds of, of multi-generational worship um, and lots of all ages programming and they are continuing that model. Uh, they have a new director of family ministry and the experiment is, is still ongoing. So some of the things, I'm going to go back to that other slide that was out of order. Uh, some of the things that, that they actually did were that they created a family space in the sanctuary. And I know it's kind of tiny, but there's a picture there of that. Um, they, they created a little table and 
um, and had the kids. And interesting, um, some congregations have said, well, we're going to create a space in the back for the, for, the, for the children. And that way, if they get a little noisy or they become a distraction, they can be whisked out the door. And actually what they found is that two things. One is putting them right up front means that they are, they're really in, engaged. You know, they're sort of, they're, they're more of a participant. You know, they're, they're small. And when you put them up front, they can see. They can see the expressions on the minister's face. They can make eye contact with, with the worship leaders. So having them up front is a, is a better experience for the kids. And in some, it, it depends very much on your space. But in the next congregation that we're going to take a little look at, um, they actually said the noise, if the kids made noise up front, it actually didn't carry to the back. If the kids were in the back, it did carry towards the front. So they experimented with where, where the noise, how the sound moved around, and found that it was better to have them in the front. So creating a family space in the sanctuary. <coughs> <It's> <coughs> it says, you know, you're welcome here. We've made a space for you. So it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a practical solution as well as, um, as, well as a, a theological and community-based um, statement. We're saying we have a place for you. You have a place here. Um, so in Binghamton, they did a lot of listening. They made some proposals about ways that they might change things. They had listening sessions for all ages, for parents and for other folks who were participating in, in worship. Uh, to hear people's concerns, uh, to try to try to help them understand, to, to do a little bit of education around why this change was happening, that it wasn't arbitrary, but that there were good ped pedagogical reasons, there were demographic reasons, and that this was that there were that there were benefits to all of the ages, not just this wasn't just to benefit the children and youth and. Uh, to provide um, to provide an experience for them that needed less volunteers, that that's part of it, but that wasn't what the whole thing was. They created what they call First Sunday, so it had all ages worship, <coughs> and then it had workshops, that model where there was a sort of a shorter worship followed by all ages workshops. They also did social action projects for uh, the combined ages. And one of the things that can be really helpful with um, a social action project is, and I know that, um, I know that they have done this um, in another setting, where they, they did the project together. So all the ages, you know, they participated in an outdoor project, for example. <coughs> but then each age group had sort of a separate processing space. So the adults could, could talk about what the experience was like for them with other adults. And the kids could, could also process it with their peers. So it's, a, it's an all ages event, but you can then, you can then um, you know, put people into, into more age appropriate groups to talk about what, to reflect back on the experience. <coughs> they um, had a weekly email focused on faith formation. So they did a lot of messaging and gave a lot of information to people so that people knew what to expect, not just parents, but everybody, that this is what's going to be happening this Sunday. This is what we hope will, it will mean for you. Um, and then they had an emphasis on at-home resources, and they also, um, which is lovely, they created a family library. <coughs> so they had books that families could borrow that followed the monthly themes. And so, you know, families could, you know, pick up two or three books related to the theme, take them home, and that, again, was, re was affirming, reinforcing whatever was happening on Sunday. They also created a parent group. Uh, and the parent group was to help parents build some skills around being that at-home resource or that at-home educator for their kids. So those are the things that they tried in Binghamton. And, um, you know, some of the things worked and some of them did not work as well. Um, in Binghamton, the family space, um, they actually had a lot of pushback um, about the family space. So 
they were rethinking how the family space was going to be incorporated into the sanctuary. Um, they're also about to embark on a large capital campaign, so they're actually going to be doing a lot of shifting around of their space, and they're going to be considering how family ministry, um, how, to, how to incorporate those ideas into this, this new space that they're creating for themselves. Um, so that's Binghamton. Uh, then I want to share with you um, about, this is the UU Society of Fairhaven, Massachusetts. Um, so there's um, <clears throat> a minister there, Jordan Nelson Long, and a religious educator, Bethany Giamalvo. And they um, found themselves in a, a challenging situation. And um, as Jordan tells it, they had 80 kids and three volunteers. She is a very, she has um, children of her own. She has an 11 year old and a nine year old, I think, nine, nine, 10, 11. And so she is a parent, so she's very supportive of the religious education program. <coughs> she talks a lot about it from the pulpit. <laughs> she was very, um, uh, very strong in her messaging to the congregation. And people were responsive. People were like, yeah, yeah, religious education, and oh yeah. And she said at, at the end of the day, they had 80 kids and three volunteers. So that no matter how much you know, nudging and how much messaging she did as the minister, uh, she found that, that the, the volunteers just were not, were not stepping up. So they found themselves really in, in a crisis situation. Uh, 80 kids is a fairly, is a fairly significant group to, to not have um, a, a solid group of volunteers. Um, so they embarked on this, this, family, uh, this family ministry. And as she put it, they made a leap into it. She decided that you know they were going to they were going to move with it, and um, because they didn't have any other choice, and she felt that one of the this is the minister now felt that one of the challenges that they were experiencing was this idea that people kind of saw religious education in a box, and that that box just didn't fit the changing culture. So the de this again the same thing that Binghamton was understanding that it's there's this demographic shift, but we're not moving with that demographic shift in the way that we're putting together our program. Uh, they um, determined that lay leader investment was absolutely vital to to the success, and um, they asked the congregation to co-own the process. The minister took a really strong role in this because, uh, and, and one of the things that they did um, was shift the language. This, this was something that was really intentional. They moved from talking about religious education to talking about faith formation. Because in the mind of the minister, if we're saying that this work is about religious education, she said half the congregation, in her case, would just turn off and say that's the work of the religious educator. And the minister felt really strongly this was part of the, con that the congregation co-owned this process. And um, so this was an example of a really strong collaboration between, you know, between the staff and between the religious educator and the minister. Um, I think that in the Binghamton model, the minister was definitely on board and very supportive um, and just, you know, sort of had a natural affinity for it based on his own history and experience, but I'm not sure that he took as much of a lead, really in Fairhaven, the minister really took almost a lead role in this, tried to be really respectful of boundaries and tried to, to really give the, the religious educator a platform to, to, do, to implement the work, but, but the minister was very vocal about her support of this shift to family ministry. Um, so they reformed it as faith formation. So to try to get away from that, it belongs, you know, upstairs, downstairs, or it belongs in the RE wing. <laughs> so um, they called their <coughs> program Reimagining Sundays. Um, and they decided um, at the outset that they were going to implement, implement this every single Sunday. So every single Sunday, all ages were in the sanctuary. Um, 
Fairhaven, Massachusetts is an old stone church. It's a literal cathedral. Um, it's a beautiful, gorgeous church, actually. And if you look at the video of uh, Jordan and, and Bethany, you'll see uh, pictures of it. Um, but it's a, it's a really large and imposing space. And so they also uh, put the kids up, kids up in front so that the kids could, could be, you know, connecting, making eye contact, and really feeling the energy of the worship presenters. Um, they uh, had, they continued the, the rituals that they had always had in worship when worship was all adults. So there was still a chalice lighting. They still had joys and concerns. They had music uh, and they had an offering. They, then they would have a focus time for either a story for all ages or a, a homily or a brief sermon that would then frame um, an all ages activity. Um, they did outdoor activities when the weather was good. They did an all music Sunday and everybody played and made music. They did um, <coughs> one about, you know, sort of creating, uh, finding your home in the church and they had people uh, wandering around the church. And um, so they, they did every, you know, they came up with lots of different activities. Uh, they indicated that it took um, about five weeks for things, to, for the routine to kind of be established here. Um, you know, uh, parents coming in and like, oh, I'm not taking my kids to RE? Wait, what's, go what's going on, you know? Um, and for older adults to, to also understand that the kids aren't leaving, kids are here. We're all in this, we're all in this together. Um, Bethany, the, the religious educator said, you know, it was a lot of work. It is a lot of work, um, but it's an experiment and they're, they're sticking with it. Um, were they only once a month? They were doing something every week though. Uh, it, was, it was all ages every week, but right. the, the thing with the, with the activities. Yeah, that was once a month. Thank you for, thank you for correcting me on that one. Yeah. Um, so, so this is, so these are two examples. This is the Binghamton model, and this is what's happening in Fairhaven. Um, there is, there are a number of other congregations, and there are a number of other ways that this is happening in congregations. Some congregations are working with um, a model, you know, the orange model. I don't know if any folks have heard about uh, the orange tour. Uh, this is a model that says, well, uh, the, 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 the church, uh, the, the church is, is the light and that's yellow and the heart, the heart is the home and that's red. And we have to, we have to integrate those two more closely. And that's where the orange comes from. I could have that backwards, but it's yellow and red and it's heart and it's light. And together they create, they, they help to to really do, um, to create re religious identity in young people. And it's really focused very much on, um, on parents as, as primary religious educators. So there's the orange work that's happening. So there are other things that are bubbling around. Um, so this is a time, you know, for you to ask questions, or maybe if you have experimented with one or two of these pieces, or maybe you're already all in around um, around family ministry. Just love to just take a few minutes to share. So, what if Carol? Are you are you uh, are you there? Are you are you uh, doing any of this? Yeah. Hi, everybody. Hi, Carol. Um, <laughs> we're doing a little bit of this stuff. Um, we are definitely uh, experimenting with uh, all age worship uh, the fifth Sunday of every month. Great. And um, yeah, so uh, I'm, um, and uh, sorry, I'm distracted. I'm at home and I'm doing parent care. And so that's okay. <laughs> my mother, that's yeah. Okay. So, um, All good. You're yeah. Being a religious educator. <laughs> yeah. Yep. The life of a religious educator. So, um, yeah. 
And so, uh, yeah, so is there anything in like in some of what these other congregations are doing that seems possible for you or or seems exciting for you? Um, I'm I what I wrote down was um, for me thinking about parent groups and how we might be able to make that connection and helping building skills to support them in being a primary religious educator. Uh, that's what really excites me. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, and there are some resources out there for that. Um, there's actually, there's some older curriculum that's been around for decades, I think, generations, we'll say, church generations, um, that's actually called Parents parents as, primary, as Religious Educators. Um, and so that sort of, there's some good foundational ideas and, 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 and activities in something like that. Um, there are also some study guides and things. Uh, there is... Um, We'll, we'll, I'll provide you with a couple of resources uh, in a minute here. Good, thanks, Carol. Um, Jess, Becca, what about? We'll start with Jess. You guys, are you guys doing any of these things yet, or you have? Does anything that really excite you? Um, we've been doing New Horizons, which is our third Sunday, which is kind of like their reimagining Sundays where we do right. work groups. We've been doing that for a while. And now on our first Sundays, we're doing all ages worship as well um, with um, Laurie Stewart leading that. And um, I'm working with her to make sure the kids are involved with the theme. Um, so Great. we're doing first and third and then still all of our multi-gens as well. So, um, and then um, we do feel like it is important that they still have some traditional RE so that yeah. they can have those connections to their peer groups as well as to the whole congregation mm -hmm. as a whole. Um, so we're trying to do kind of like a, like a mix. Yeah. And, and that's, yeah, a lot of congregations are, are doing that. So it is, it's, it's sort of this hybrid uh, kind of uh, implementation. So that's, that's great. That's good to hear. Yeah. You guys are, you guys, I mean, for, for your, your congregation uh, is smaller, and so that, that's kind of all in for you. Twice a month is, is pretty good. So yeah. that's great. Becca, you have anything to add to that? Yeah, I think um, like the Fairhaven model, um, we, we basically, I mean, I think the reasons we came to this right now is um, the resignation of our longtime DRE and the volunteer picture. And so we decided to look at that as an opportunity instead of, I mean, it was a challenge, but instead of looking at it as, oh, this is terrible, yeah. we decided to look at it as an opportunity. Um, and um, I'm really excited about it because um, I love kids, and so I've always felt sort of torn. Mm -hmm. as I've always been involved in the RE program and, and teaching there, and then I've always also liked the traditional worship and doing sermons. And so for me, all ages worship is a fabulous thing. And so um, I'm really interested, not so much this year, because I'm doing a lot of the um, Mission lay ministry mm -hmm. training program stuff. Yeah. In the future, yeah. I'm really interested in doing more of the um, whole congregation worship as well and developing. Um, I'm really interested in developing more of the um, the multiple intelligences mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, because I've I've mainly done sermons. You know, and you pick. You pick hymns that are on the theme and yes you know, but, um, <laughs> I'm really interested in learning more about how you bring in all those different elements in a way that isn't um, contrived isn't, or awkward <laughs> what contrived or awkward well and, and isn't necessarily when we used the multi-gen model of doing the skit or doing the so something that feels more like a hybrid of a traditional worship service mm -hmm, mm -hmm. or subtly bringing in all those different. Right, right. Yeah, I mean, I know um, w one, of the, one of the pushbacks that I, I hear from a lot of congregations around 
the shifting into that all ages or multi-generational worship is, well, that's going to dumb down, you know, going to dumb down the worship. And, and, and the fact of the matter is there are plenty of adults out there who are not, you know, are not, um, don't have that learning. Uh, that's not their learning strength, that intellectual lecture type uh, of event, but, but who appreciate, you know, movement or who appreciate um, something with, that, you know, with the hands or uh, appreciate, um, m you know, uh, music more. So uh, there's a book called Worship That Works by Wayne Arneson right. and Kathleen Rowlands, a wonderful little book about worship. And in there, they say, you know, what, what the thing about having children in worship is what works for kids also works for adults. Right, right. Um, <coughs> So, it's so easy in a traditional sermon to get lost. Yeah. You're just, I mean, if you're engaged in it, you start thinking about things and then you're all the way over there and the sermon over here and you're like, yeah, yeah. Well, good. Any, any, <coughs> any questions? <laughs> I guess my question would be, do we have more resources for the multiple intelligences? Uh, good resources for that. Well, I mean, so it depends on, on sort of what you think you want, what, what you mean by resources. Um, you know, Tapestry of Faith, uh, it, you know, okay, so Tapestry of Faith is, is structured like a traditional curriculum, but it takes into, it, it incorporates all of the learning the learning skills, all of the, the learning, the different styles of learning. So you can go in, you can search in something like Tapestry of Faith and look for, put your theme in and look for uh, movement or look for, you know, different kinds of activities, guided meditation, or that kind of thing. So you can kind of play around. So you're not using Tapestry of Faith as uh, lesson one, lesson two, lesson three, but you're, you're using it more vertically, you know, you're, you're looking at, okay, what are some of the guided meditations that are available? What are some of the stories that are available to me on this topic? So that's one place that you can get information. There's also, there's a, just a, there's a ton of stuff, you know, sort of secular stuff out there about, um, about uh, you know, how we learn and, and different multiple intelligences. Um, there's some stuff um, in the um, teacher development renaissance module and all of those things are available on uua.org you can uh, look at the look at the leader guide there and look at some of the activities and some of the, the models that they talk about for learning so uh, those are some some resources for you i can i can dig a little deeper if you know if you want but there's a lot there's a lot there's a lot out there um, are you familiar with um, Marsha McPhee and Mark Bellatini? Are two names I've <coughs> sure. I'm familiar with both of them. Marsha is uh, is a fabulous um, worship. Um, I don't even know what to call her. You know, she is a a leader in uh, in in uh, implementing uh, quality worship. And, and she does she does uh, workshops and, and and a lot of a lot of good work around that. So strong, yeah. Her her stuff is very good, very well done. I'm not sure what Mark is doing. Mark's uh, you know he was a minister in Columbus, um, mm -hmm. so I'm not familiar with what he might be doing right now around that. Yeah, I don't know what he's doing now, but I had heard he really worked on layering. Yes, yes, he did work on layering. Um, I'm not sure, you know, how much he, you know, how much that translates towards family ministry. I mean, he really okay. was, he was focused more towards adult worship. Okay, for sure. So, but yeah, both of them are, are, are excellent resources. So let me move to the next, just, so these are just some uh, resources. So the General Assembly workshop, um, Rebecca, it sounds like you've already watched that. Um, that is available as a recording. 
and that has uh, that's a triple header. That's got um, uh, that has Kimberly Sweeney doing sort of an introduction, and then it has the folks from Fairhaven, and then it has another congregation, Minnesota, I think. Um, but so another congregation talking about how they've implemented family ministry. So uh, great for visual learners. It's a, it's an audio visual uh, video recording. There is also so Kimberly Sweeney uh, has a has a website and she has some some uh, materials that she she sells she markets. But there is if you're if you're sort of at the beginning of this process and you want to help people understand why this shift might be needed, why we need to sort of let go of the way that we have uh, organized our Sunday school programs uh, for the last 60 years and why we have to move towards something new. She does have a discussion guide that can be a useful tool in, in doing some education around family ministry. Uh, there is a... Um, I think it's like a 20 page report uh, that Ann Kadlicek created around the work that she did. And it's, you know, it's, um, it's got photos, it's got lots of, of good information, much more detail. You know, I just kind of lifted up some, some highlights. <coughs> and then um, the UUA has some stuff on family ministry. If you just Google uh, family ministry, not a lot comes up, but some stuff does come up. Um, but they have this nice little section of just some some reflection questions that help you know to help affirm uh, sort of the, the the idea of family and the presence of family. So I thought that might be something that if you were doing a parent group or if you were doing uh, some kind of a having some kind of a discussion forum around family ministry, that those questions might be um, might be some good conversation starters for you. So those are some resources that I put together. Also. Um, so let me just end the show, and I'll send everybody the, um, the um, PowerPoint. I will also say that, that Anne Kadlicek um, is, not, uh, is not working as a religious educator right now. She has entered seminary, and so she's at Yale Divinity School. Um, but she is working with Chris McCann, who's a religious educator in Southern Maryland, um, around... Um, a tool for congregations to do some education, some assessment, and, and maybe someday move towards a, sort of a credential or a, um, you know, a, a become a, like a family ministry affirming congregation. And they've put together um, a really, you know, really comprehensive uh, little guide to sort of what they think you need to do and when you need to do it. So it's their work. I, I, I'm not going to share their work yet, um, but we are at the UUA sort of looking at how we can support them in, in trying to, you know, create something a little bit more structured for congregations who want to do this work and, and move from, uh, from a traditional model to something different, to something family oriented. So, um, you know, and, and, um, and the folks in Fairhaven, they are all, uh, they love to talk about this. So uh, if you are interested in talking to them, I'd be happy to share contact information with them as well. Yes, Becca. So um, you can always count on me to have a million questions and comments. All right. I guess my other question is um, with lay leadership. Jess and I have been working with the board <coughs> The worship committee and um, I think we're getting there but I think um, there is still I don't know Jess you may disagree but I think there is still in many ways a perception that this is the religious education yeah, yeah. and that Laurie Stewart is working with us and that's a special thing as part of and I, I don't think the worship committee the worship committee is really reluctant um, yeah. to feel like this is part of their own. It's on their plate. Yeah. <laughs> the board seems to be on board, <laughs> but the worship committee, not as much. Yeah. Yeah. And I mean, so the, the two, 
examples that I've provided for you are both congregations that are a little bit bigger. They have, they have full-time ministers, um, you know, and ministers do, do bring, you know, a different level of energy and urgency to, to these kinds of programmatic shifts. So there's definitely more of a challenge in, in, in a congregation where, um, you know, leader is sort of leader, leader to leader, you know, when it's a, a peer conversation, uh, other, other power dynamics enter into the conversation. <coughs> so, um, you know, I, I think, you know, it's, it's time. Um, it's also, you know, I think one of the things that, um, I don't know if it was Jordan, one of the folks, who've been doing this work said is, you know, the more you are able to provide positive experiences for people around this, the more, you know, they, they, you, you hit that tipping point. You get a tipping point where people are, are more open and are more willing to listen. And so sometimes it's just, you know, sticking with it. Um, you can also, um, you know, it's, it's, you're also, it's a time, it's a, it's a, it's an experiment. You know, we're all in a time of experimentation. So the other thing is to, is to try to read the tea leaves and figure out, well, what's working here and let go of what's not working, right? Let go of that for now. And, 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 and then really focus on what seems to be working and focus on doing it well so that, so that it continues to be a positive experience for people. So couple of quick thoughts on that so but yay for you guys that you you're you you really you're 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 all in right now with this I, I know I know your leadership and uh, it's great so it's it's 759 where we've we've come to the end of our hour any other burning questions before we say good night well, I so appreciate that you all were here and, and engaging in this conversation. And well, thank you. Yeah. yeah. We'll see you maybe next month. So bye, Carol. Bye, Jess. Bye, Becca. Always good to see you.